Hello, and welcome to Runers. So, this is something that's flying under the radar on Steam currently. It's something that uh, I don't think a lot of people would even know about if it weren't for the demo that was released. And that's something you can try right now if you want. The demo is actually really very good. Uh, and I think that indie devs especially, because it costs to make a demo, uh, a lot of people don't really realize that, but demos are expensive to make. That's why a lot of indie devs do not make them. But, I think that they should be rewarded for their demo, because it has a lot of content in it. So, if this video isn't enough for you, by the way, and you want to try out the game yourself, the demo page on Steam has, has a Runer's demo for you. And uh, it's got the first three levels of the dungeon, as well as five classes, five races, and a bunch of other stuff. So, let's just explain what I'm talking about here. Runer's is a top-down, sort of, throw-all-the-spells kind of spellcrafting game. I suppose a lot of people would uh, compare it to things like Binding of Isaac and Rogue Light games, but it really isn't one of those. You see, there was... There was this game called Triangle Wizard, which is kind of a funny name, that came out in 2008, which... It did this whole sort of real-time, top-down game with roguelike sensibilities quite a while before games like Binding of Isaac came along and kind of popularized it into a genre. And this game reminds me a lot of Triangle Wizard. It's much less of the sort of roguelite style. It has things like permadeath and, and things like that, but it's, it's much, much more like Triangle Wizard, and that's kind of... Interesting, because this is the only game I've actually seen that reminds me of that. I've never seen another another game that has a similar gameplay style to that one. It's an interesting game, actually. It's free if you want to search it and try it out. But this is kind of like a modern version of that. So to get into it, you've got you've got quite a lot of a lot of options here. Because first of all, there there are these challenges. There are a bunch of them, and some of them aren't unlocked at first. You have to do various things. It tells you. And uh, these are actually really, really hard, a lot of them. Some of them aren't too bad, but some of them get very challenging. But these are something that uh, can almost be thought of as a extended tutorial, if you will, because they help to teach you some of the more advanced techniques of the game. And of course, there are tutorials here. Now, uh, it also has leaderboards, if you want, for each of the... Uh, difficulties. Now, I actually had the number two place until Scoots came along and uh, beat us all at our own game here, but I expect my score to plummet when the game comes out tomorrow. This is actually being recorded on the first, so any sort of release day jitters, hopefully, don't apply. All the way up to Apocalypse difficulty. Now, it seems like whenever you beat the boss on a difficulty, it unlocks the next one, so that's interesting. But to just jump into it, here's how it works. So, variety is key in this game. You have a huge number of choices here. You've got 20 passives, which are basically a race, and 20 classes, which have an activatable ability. And uh, the last of both are locked for various reasons. Now, to choose the... I haven't really found one that I think is just really, really underpowered, per se. I think they're all pretty interesting. In fact, my winning run was with the Wisp, which is actually one of the uh, more squishy ones. But we're gonna do the Chimera, I think. The Chimera lets you have a random, sort of small percentage chance to double cast a spell. Which is pretty cool. And as for our class, I like the Deific Assassin because it lets you turn any spell into an AoE spell that has a 100% chance to crit for one cast, which is very nice. And then, you choose a spell to start with, and there are 285 spells in this game. The whole game it has no melee weapons or anything, it's entirely based on using magic. And uh, these are representative of a rune. Now, obviously the game is called Runers, and runes are a central concept in the game, so that's how you actually create your spells. And each one of these represents one rune. So... I'm going to start with Mind Spike, because its its ability to pierce through multiple enemies is interesting. Each one of these is indicative of one element and has its own various advantages and disadvantages. Chaos Bolt is almost like a shotgun. Corruption debuffs enemies. Magic Missile reduces your cooldowns. Uh, kinetic Bolt's extremely fast, and so on and so forth. Each of these has their own different characteristics, but Mind Spike, with its ability to pierce through enemies, is quite useful, and with Multicast uh, from the Chimera, it can it can do quite a bit of damage pretty quickly early on, so we're going to start with that. 
and here we go. So there is a little bit of a story, it's a little confusing, it's all given in these little quotes here at the beginning of each floor of the, uh, the uh, area. Now, the way the floor system works is there are ten floors in the game, and of course they're randomly generated. And the actual tile set you see, this is called the mine, actually changes. So sometimes you'll start in these ruins, uh, sometimes you'll start in a mine, sometimes in a sort of, like, kind of underground, jungly, foresty kind of place. The tile set changes, and every three floors you'll get a new one. And it gets harder and harder. So, to start off with, there are lots of destructible items in the area, and uh, blowing these up will, of course, give you a small chance to drop a rune or a heart to help restore your health, which is... Uh, very, very valuable because your health doesn't regenerate unless you're playing the, uh, what is it, uh, the sp are they called a sprit dryad? Spring, and I don't remember what the, I think it's a dryad, blessing of the dryad. So, we're gonna ignore this room in a minute, and I'll tell you why in a second, but we're gonna go there later when we have a better chance to actually beat it. So, here we go. And they, you know, Binding of Isaac or old school Zelda style, the rooms are laid out in, in this sort of pattern you can see here on the map screen. And we're just gonna get into it. So, already, this is quite a few enemies on screen for what you would consider the first level of a game, and that's that carries on throughout this entire game. You will see lots and lots and lots of enemies on screen. Even in boss fights and things, there's a boss fight every three floors. You will come across pretty large crowds of enemies, and bosses and many bosses will summon lots of adds, and you're going to be kiting around a lot because you're using a lot of spells. And, uh, that's kind of the way the combat works in the game. Lots of pretty precise mouse aiming. Luckily, the mouse aiming works very, very well. With a lot of kiting and movement, and you're just encouraged not to be still most of the time. Because, uh, there are just going to be so many enemies coming at you. So, the way the sort of meat of the game works is crafting spells. And enemies and sometimes objects will occasionally drop runes. I got two here. I got two entropy runes. And these are all the runes. There's water, fire, air, earth, shock, mind, speed, dark light, and entropy. And uh, crafting them in a different combination will give you various spells, and that's how you actually progress. You do level up. That blue meter there underneath my health is an experience bar. Uh, leveling up doesn't actually increase your stats in the same way as you would think. It gives you a choice of perks to help you out. So, whenever you put a rune in the combiner, you can make a spell. And, uh... If you put multiple runes in here, you can make better spells. Uh, and once you've actually made a spell once, you don't need these. These are called combiners. Uh, these are sort of rare drops from champion enemies. A double combiner allows you to combine two different runes, or two of the same runes, together to make a spell. But since I've crafted Lottery before, I don't actually need a combiner to make it again, which is an interesting feature that it doesn't really tell you. If I remember right, they might have put it in the tutorial now, but that's something to remember. You don't need combiners if you already know what the spell is. And then triple combiners, these which are even more rare drops, are needed to make three rune spells, which are the strongest and sort of most specialized spells in the game. And uh, they are kind of your meat and potatoes that you'll be using later on, because you won't really have triple combiners early on. What you can do is, if you have four doubles, you can combine them into one triple, or if you want, you can just use this. This little icon here shatters the combiners and gives you experience for them. So that way you still have a use for them, even if, say, you know all of the double spells in the game, so you no longer need these, you can convert them into the better ones or break them for experience. Which is pretty important, actually, because levels are quite useful. Now, the way this works is, as you can see, this description here has a, uh, it's a mind spell, and it has the mind rune symbol next to the uh, stat that says duration. What you can do is you can pick up one of these runes and drop it onto a spell that is made from that type of rune, so obviously this entropy won't work with a mind spell, but you get the idea. And when you do that, it will enhance the particular stat that the rune symbol is next to. So if I put a mind rune into this, the duration goes up, which means the bullet flies for a longer period of time, so it has the ability to pierce more enemies. And you also have rune levels, which are the same thing, but they're passive and they don't require you to actually spend a rune to upgrade something. So if you have an extra mind rune level, this will be a more powerful spell. That's the way it works. The rune level is limited to 10 levels, unless you get certain perks that enhance it one at a time. 
And that's really the way the game works. From the beginning to the end, those are the mechanics that you're dealing with. You have to remember your passive ability that you get from your race, as well as to use your active from your class, and everything is cooldown based. There is no mana or anything like that. And uh, as you can see, this spell has a pretty short cooldown. Pretty much all of the one rune spells have short cooldowns, because they're going to be your kind of main attack spells early on in the game. There are a lot of different types of spells. Like I said, there are 285 individual spells in the game, which is a ridiculous amount. And not all of them are actually attacks. Some of them are buffs and debuffs and all kinds of things like that. So it's really about experimentation, because the first time you craft a spell, you don't know what it actually is, unless you've looked it up or something, which would be dirty, dirty cheating. And you'll have to craft it to figure out what it does. And as you sort of expand your repertoire of knowledge, which is represented, by the way, in this rune decks here, you can start to kind of make your ideal loadout whenever you play. Because again, you don't actually need the combiners to make spells you already know about. So there are a huge amount of enemies in the game as well. In fact, one thing I'd praise the game for right off the bat is its variety. Because you have 20 classes, 20 races, 285 spells, a bunch of different tile sets, and I don't know how many enemies, but a lot of them. In fact, if I pause one more time, go to the uh, bestiary here, 140 different enemy types. Yeah, there's just, there's a ton of them, including many bosses like the big skeleton, the Yggdrasil branch, and the voidling here, and boss bosses like these guys, which again, you'll fight every three levels of the dungeon, and there are 10 levels in total on any given playthrough. Of course, you won't see all the tile sets on one playthrough, this is very clearly a game meant to be played multiple times. And eventually you'll come across these guys, as you can see this mage is glowing, which is a good, uh, good sign, and he's got a plus one under his name, which means he has some kind of bonus. He's hefty in this case, which hefty means he hits harder with his abilities, but they move slower. So you don't want to get hit with that. Now those plus one enemies have a higher chance of dropping runes and combiners. So finding and killing them is a good thing as well as the fact that they give more experience. Experience is actually gained fairly slowly early on, but you will start to level up quite quickly later because you'll be fighting harder enemies in larger hordes that will require you to, uh, to sort of get a lot stronger much quicker to deal with. And also, there are these various types of, of rooms. Now, you might be noticing these doors sparkle, which is just, just fabulous. And when you go into a sparkly room, the room has an aura. In this case, it decreases bullet speed, so shots move slower. Uh, now, room auras affect you and enemies. So if they're negative, they debuff you and the enemies. If they're positive, they buff you and the enemies. So that's something to consider. Room auras are... Most floors have, you know, a good four or five room auras at least on them. And then there are these. These uh, sort of green rooms here, these are event rooms. Now when you go into these, time will be paused and you'll see a little symbol in the middle. And uh, there are all kinds of different events. And in this case, it's kind of a, a Simon Says sort of thing. You'll have to, it'll pop up a bunch of sparkles and you have to touch them in the order they flash. This is really difficult because there are a bunch of them and I usually miss at least one, so. Okay, that one, there, 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 there. Okay, so it went, uh, here, here, no, was it here? I think it was here, 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 shoot, here, 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 yeah! Now, if you pass an event room, you get to choose a one of four of these bonuses, and random just gives you one of these randomly. So I'm going to get extra defense. Now, these rooms also usually give you a lot of experience when you beat them, so they're very lucrative to go into, but they can be quite difficult sometimes. There are a lot of different types of events. Whoa! Now, here's one of the rooms you can see where my AoE ability is going to come in handy, so trigger it, and boom! Oh, I didn't really hit enough rats with that. But yes, even though this is the first floor, you can tell the game is actually throwing a large number of enemies at you at once. Which is very indicative of just the way the game works. It loves to throw hordes at you, even in boss fights. So the game goes on like this, 
and you will continue to craft more and more spells and put runes into your currently existing spells to make them more powerful and just keep going. You'll start out with these four spell slots at the top. You'll start out with a left click, a right click, a one and a two. Uh, the first two bosses that you beat will also give you a three and a four spell slot so you can hold more spells. The second to last slot uh, the second to last boss that you beat unlocks another storage slot, so you don't have to delete as many spells if you want to keep a couple. And then the final boss, well, you, you beat the game. So it just keeps going like this, really. This is essentially the game. It's uh, deceptively simple. It's easy to learn, but hard to master because because of the large, large variety of race class combinations and spells, as well as the fact that rune levels can actually drastically change the way spells work and change the way you'd want to use them. You'll come across situations where it's just... You can have bad runs at first, really. If you don't know what a lot of the spells are yet or how best to use them, you can definitely get screwed over early on by not getting the kind of runes that you maybe know about. But one thing is for sure, the runes tend to have specific characteristics that they will apply to the spells you create with them. So even though it might be an unknown spell that you haven't made yet, you can sort of make some guesses once you kind of learn. For instance, entropy runes tend to have very random elements. So runes made with entropy, or spells made with entropy runes tend to be buffs or debuffs that kind of randomly affect you or the enemy, or projectiles that fire in kind of random configurations, or things like that, things that have a random element to them. Uh, earth is often very hard hitting but slow moving or it takes a lot of skill to use. Mind often creates things that home in or have kind of weird movement characteristics. Uh, let's see here. Fire, of course, tends to make very destructive things. Dark tends to make things that uh, debuff enemies that you hit with and things like that. You, you can kind of get an idea of what the spells are even before you make them once you've made enough spells with certain runes to kind of learn the general characteristics they tend to apply which is interesting the system is actually very nuanced it's it's pretty cool and i love the way that you can actually upgrade your current spells by just putting more runes onto them so fire and air makes the flame devil fire and entropy makes variant burn which is pretty useful so as you can tell some runes actually have these uh, kind of like ARPG style name, like prefixes and suffixes that add different characteristics to them, which is cool. So I'm gonna make Variant Burn. It shoots a wavy fireball with low damage, but a very high crit damage multiplier. And as you can see, if I add an entropy rune to it, it'll upgrade the crit multiplier. So I'm gonna do that right now. So if you watch that, it goes from 400% to 420%. So it looks like it's gonna add 20% per entropy rune which is pretty cool. Also, any spells you move on the bar will have a 5 second cooldown before they can be used again, so doing that in the middle of battle, not the best idea. And really, it will just continue on like this. You will continue building up your arsenal of spells and knowledge of spells, hopefully leveling up to get more perks, and increasing your rune levels to get stronger with the current spells that you have. And making your way through 10 floors of nonsense. There are enough enemy types to keep it interesting, in my opinion, because there are lots and lots of different spells for you. But it helps that enemies are actually able to use a lot of them as well, which is interesting because you can actually learn strategies from watching the way the enemies will use some of the projectile spells at you. Right now I'm just fighting novice enemies because it's the first floor. But later on, when you fight some of the, like, master elemental mages and things like that, they'll use different combinations which you can kind of learn their strategies from, which is an interesting way to do things. Uh, oh god. The boss fights are particularly interesting because uh, they don't just tend to summon adds and hit really hard. They tend to have very interesting, almost bullet hell style mechanics where they'll fire out a ton of spells at you with weird patterns and stuff, and you have to learn to dodge it all. Which is pretty cool. It's... It reminds me again of Triangle Wizard a lot, which is awesome because I love that game. You know, I lost a lot of time to that game back in, say, 2010 when I kind of discovered it in a big way. And uh, it... I've never played another game since that actually had that, that kind of gameplay. And it's simple, but it's fun. 
and it's very rewarding because it uh, it rewards experimentation and variety, and I'm a very variety focused gamer, so it's it's something that I enjoy a lot. So this this is Runers. It's I guess not actually that hard to explain really, but it's very fun to play. Oh, level up. What do I get? Let's see. Inventor's nice. Latent force is good. I like that. Because if you get swarmed by rats or something, they can very quickly take your health gauge down, but with that it kind of uh, knocks them away, so it gives you a, a better chance to escape. And this continues on. Your strategies continue to build upon each other as you you work with the about 50 or so perks that are available. You get a choice of four every level up, as well as the uh, passive upgrades from completing rooms, and also whenever you complete a floor, it gives you another upgrade. And uh, you will basically be combining your passive and active class and race abilities with the perks and spell choices you make to kind of form a strategy. And that makes each run actually quite a bit different because you never know what kind of rune drops you're going to get and what sort of spells you're going to want to to combine. You know, you're probably going to be discovering new spells each run with a total of 285, there's a lot of room for experimentation. And what that means is you're going to be... You're going to be playing differently each time. Because you're kind of forced to. You're, you're forced to make new strategies each time. And uh, that is one of the ultimate forms of replayability, in my opinion. That's something that roguelite-style games tend to have a lot of. And although this doesn't have things like items, really. Like, you know, there's no equipment or or usable items, your activatable ability kind of takes the place of those. It makes for a pretty neat game. So, there you go, I guess. That's, I think that's all I got to say. Oh god, those wind hunters are the worst thing. I hate them so much. So if you want to give it a shot, I will link you in the description below this video to the Steam page. It will be available at time of recording tomorrow, September 2nd. And uh, you can pick it up for $10. It's not bad. By the way, I'd like to make another point. The music is actually pretty good. It's some really good um, kind of digital score with some almost synth-like stuff and a little bit of like violin and things like that. It's it's not super action-packed music, but it it's very good sounding. It actually reminds me a lot of Ronald Jinkies music. If you don't know who Ronald Jinkies is, he was he's done several things. One of which was uh, the music for a game called Sequence. So if you've never heard of Sequence, I'd actually recommend you check it out. It's sort of a rhythm-based thing, thingamajig. It's like a Dance Dance Revolution style game almost. It's kind of weird, but it's awesome. And that's... I don't think the music is actually composed by him, but it reminds me a lot of a lot of his music, the kind of digital synth style. So there you go, guys. Uh, if you want some some more kind of information, the Steam page has a couple of quotes on it, and you can find the reviews that those come from because they're pretty well written. And also, like I said, there's a very, very good demo available. So if you want to go check that out, you should because, again, demos are free. And I feel like, I feel like devs should be awarded for making such good demos because we don't see a lot of demos nowadays because they take, they take development time and they take money. So, it's a risk that I feel like should be rewarded. Thank you for watching, everyone, and uh, go check it out on Steam. Oh god! Okay, I'll see you guys next time.